2022, and this is, I guess, the start of a new series called uh, News and Views. And I'm going to uh, just be test driving this out for the next week, uh, just to see what it's like, if you all enjoy it, if I enjoy it. Uh, these are going to be streams that are going to be roughly at this time. I'm going to try to make it at uh, 5 p.m. my time, uh, perhaps 4 p.m. sometimes, or 6 p.m. Uh, sometimes. Right now it's 5 p.m. And I'm going to be discussing the news that's going on and any particular topic that I think is kind of interesting. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, for the time being, it's just going to be on the phone. <laughs> so, so, you know, no coach Kino uh, for the time being. You know, later on when um, hopefully when I have access to my gear, because for those of you who are new uh, subscribers or, or new fans, thank you very much. But, uh, you know, I'm kind of famous for, like, doing all kinds of crazy camera angles and all kinds of stuff because I like gear and I like fooling around with, uh, with, 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 the, with the format of YouTube videos, right? And so, hang on, let me just move this a little bit back. Uh, there we go. And uh, what I want to do is um, I want to do a new show. It's going to be Monday through Friday. And on Saturdays, it's going to be Saturday Super Chats where I'm going to read all of the Super Chats and answer any question or make any comment to every single super chat that I've gotten during the week. Because so far, you know, I've been doing these uh, live streams and I've gotten a whole boatload of uh, super chats and I haven't read anyone, any any one of them rather. And so I definitely want to get to them. And, uh, you know, and of course I thank the people who have sent me super chats, but I want to read them all and, and do it in an orderly fashion. And usually what happens is that on my phone, I'm not actually able to see them, okay? I have to set up my computer and, and just do some rigmarole because I only have my phone and an old uh, MacBook Air that's about, I think it's a, I bought it in like uh, late 2008, uh, excuse me, late 2014. So we're coming up on, uh, you know, seven and a half years now. So anyway, um, I don't have the state of the art equipment. And so I have to like do a little preparation to do the super chats, but I want to do them and I will do them. And so, um, yeah, that, that's the, the goal at this point. Um, you know, something to uh, keep me busy. And uh, the other thing I uh, announced today on my Patreon, see, during the month of March, um, quite frankly, this whole situation with the uh, war really discombobulated me. And I felt way behind insofar as my Patreon content is concerned, which is something that weighs very heavily on me, to tell you the truth, because I feel that it's a responsibility. And so today I uh, posted uh, something on my Patreon feed. It's public, so you can read it, uh, even if you're not like subscribed to me or even a member of Patreon. And in that uh, note that I put on Patreon, I basically said that I'm going to you know, try to catch up with the work that I owe my subscribers. And I asked them to forgive me, of course. And, and many of them were, almost all of them were extremely understanding. And I thank them. But I told them I was going to make up the work. But um, for the time being, it would have to be a little bit different. Because before, I used to do these individual videos of like the typical Coach Kino kind of way. But since I don't have access to the equipment, I can't do those videos. And so what I'm going to be doing is for my $5 subscribers, I'm going to be... Uh, giving them my work in progress uh, because I'm writing a project. It's called Anti-Narrative. And it's about this war. And it's about the war and it's about my own participation in it. Microscopic though it is. And um, it's discussing the issue of the information war. Mm -hmm. I mean, the overall war itself, my subjective experience of it, as, you know, being in Kiev when it started and then coming down here to uh, Kharkov and perhaps going elsewhere later on during this war and, um, you know, discussing that part, but also discussing my participation in the information warfare aspect of it. Because clearly there's been like a whole propaganda war going on and it's been very exciting, you know. And so, uh, yeah, so I'm working on this, this new book, Anti-Narrative. And for my $5 subscribers, rather than do the Wednesday video as usual, I'm going to be releasing um, 2,000 word excerpts from the work in progress of anti-narrative uh, every Wednesday. And for my $10 subscribers, the $10 tier, which is the webinar tier, uh, I'm going to be doing um, Q&As with them after these broadcasts, see, the, the news and views broadcasts are going to be like at five and they're going to last, oh, 90 minutes to 120 minutes. And after that, I'm going to go over to Telegram, 
which I've finally been able to fix so that I can have interaction. And on Telegram, I'm going to be doing exclusive Q&As with the webinar tier supporters on Patreon, okay? They're gonna be live and you'll be able to ask questions and comments live. And so, yeah, it'll be a lot of fun, okay? Now that's gonna be starting on Wednesday, okay? Because, you know, figuring all this out and getting ready for it, it takes a little bit of time. And so on Wednesday, I'm gonna start doing this. And um, yeah, I'm looking forward to it. It's gonna be Q and A's, um, like I said, after every broadcast for at least half an hour or as much as 45 minutes. So if you're on those broadcasts, please, please be brief and to the point so that as many people as possible get the opportunity to ask questions and make their comments. Okay, so that's housekeeping and that's out of the way. Now, what am I gonna talk about today? I'm gonna to talk about an election that happened yesterday in Hungary some uh, issues that happened in Pakistan and other issues that are going on in India. And, um, you know, just a whole bunch of little topics, right? And then I'm going to focus on the war that's going on. And finally, the meat and potatoes of this broadcast is going to be the question, why does the West hate Russia so much? I think it's a valid question uh, because it's obvious that people in the West hate Russia with a passion that is just disproportionate. And I figure it would be smart to discuss why. Mm? So it's going to be, like I said, it's going to be several topics, the Hungary issue, the Pakistan issue, the Indian issue, the Ukraine issue that wants the $300 billion that the West stole from Russia because they stole from it. And then I'm going to talk about the war. I'm going to talk a little bit about the Bucha, the Bucha massacre, so-called, the alleged Bucha massacre that, uh, you know, yesterday when it came out, it really you know, threw me for a loop, but now I've thought about it and seen some more stuff and I'll give you my conclusions. I'm gonna talk about the war, how the war itself is going. You know, spoiler alert, it's over. It's just simply over, okay? And, uh, you know, it, it, there's gonna be a big battle, but the battle has already been won by the Russians, okay? And, uh, you know, the Russians are gonna take over the whole thing. And, and at this point, the political leadership in Ukraine, if they actually cared about the Ukrainian people, if they actually cared about all those young men who are gonna needlessly die, they'd surrender now because it's over. It, it's just simply over. And I'm gonna explain why. And a lot of people who are gonna li listen to me are gonna be saying, but how is this possible? The Russians retreated from Kiev. The Ukrainians beat them in Kiev. No, they didn't beat them in Kiev, man, grow up, okay? It was a strategic retreat or not even a strategic retreat. It was a strategic withdrawal to move forces over to where the action really is. Uh, and I'll discuss it in just a, when I get to it in just a little bit, but let's go you know, step by step, okay? Now, the first thing that really was really interesting was Viktor Orban, the president of Hungary, won a fourth term as president of Hungary, and his party, Fidesz, which he rules with an iron grip, they got a super majority. I mean, they blew the competition away the Westerners, the Eurocrats, the Euro weenies, as I call them, they put together this weird coalition of just about every other party, all the left-wing parties, including the far right-wing parties, they all joined into one party to fight Viktor Orban and the Fidesz party. I, I, I'm not pronouncing that correctly, I'm sorry, but you know, I don't speak Hungarian. The Fidesz par party, whatever they're called. The Fidesz party got 135 seats, and that corresponds to 67.8% of the party. They have only a single single chamber. So that's a super majority. They can do whatever they want, okay? And he ran, this is really interesting, he ran on an anti-leftist platform, and he said it, he asked, you know, you know during, uh, before, during, and after the election, in his victory speech, he said, we are running against the leftists. We are running against the European global leftists. We are running against the George Soroses of the world. Mm -hmm. and, and the way he phrased it was very interesting. It, it alluded very elliptically to the ethno-religious background of Mr. Soros. We are running, he said, Viktor Orban said, we are running against Zelensky because Zelensky had called him out, you know, and said, you know, be a brother and all that, you know, you, you know, help me, help me, you know, and it just tried to guilt trip him. I mean, Zelensky, in some speech Zelensky gave to the European Parliament or some nonsense like that, he tried to guilt trip uh, uh, Viktor Orban, and Viktor Orban was having none of it. Mm. Mm. 
Victor Orban basically said he gave a big middle finger to the global American empire. He gave a big middle finger to the whole liberal paradigm that has been relentlessly pushed. The liberal paradigm of degeneracy and decadence. Mm -hmm. Because that's what it is, okay? And don't give me the stuff that it's not, that it's freedom. This is not freedom, okay? Uh, 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 freedom to indoctrinate children and to pervert small children in, in, into being, uh, you know, catamites and, and, and whores at the age of eight. No, that's, that's not freedom. That's degeneracy, okay? Simple as that. And decadence where you have... Uh, you know, no, 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 it's not. It's decadent and degenerate and Viktor Orban is right. And obviously the Hungarian people <laughs> very much agreed. I mean, they gave him a resounding majority. He's untouchable, okay? And it was so funny because there was this um, Swedish politician, right? Who denounced the Hungarian voters. Mm? And he's saying, and he said in some tweet, and a guy with like, a few hundred thousand uh, Twitter followers who used to be a big wheel, you know, back in the day. And he, now he's just a nobody. Um, and Anders, something like that. I'll, I'll, it's not important. But he said that the Hungarians should be ejected from the EU. Because, see, ultimately these people, they only care about democracy when they get their vote. When, they get, when the vote goes their way. But when the vote goes against them, they show their true colors. And their true colors are totalitarian. Mm -hmm. Not authoritarian, totalitarian. They want to control you. An authoritarian regime, just so that you understand the difference, it's very important. And if you want to look it up, I would suggest you read up on uh, Jean Kirkpatrick, the former uh, U.S. ambassador to the United Nations, a very skilled dip diplomat. Jean Kirkpatrick came up with a no notion, the differentiation between totalitarian regimes and authoritarian regimes. And her notion was that the authoritarian regimes wanted to have political control, but were not interested in, in micromanaging the people. The totalitarian regime does want to mi micro micromanage the people, okay? That's the difference, okay? And, uh, you know, the Europeans, yeah, they're totalitarian, yeah? Uh, you know, they, they dress it up in the, the skin suit of democracy, but it's ultimately totalitarian. And if you understand that, then it's all crystal clear. Mm -hmm. Okay, so anyway, Victor Orban won decisively, okay? Now, this is very interesting because Hungary is clearly moving in the direction of Russia. Hang on a second. Sorry about that. Oh, no. Um, Victor Orban has very strong relations with Vladimir Putin. Yeah. Sorry about that. As I was saying, Viktor Orban has very strong relationships with um, Vladimir Putin. And uh, he's not going to have any problem getting gas or food or anything like that from the Russians. Okay, And this new, um, it really is a new world order. Okay, The fair world order, as the Chinese and the Indians and the Russians are calling it. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Anyway, uh, we're getting the new world order, but not the one that the globalists thought that, that we were going to get. Mm -hmm. So anyway, what's interesting is that Viktor Orban has very strong relationships with Russia. Hungary could prove to be a pivot country in the long term. That's my opinion, and I think that you should pay attention to this possibility. That, you see, Viktor Orban has a thorny relationship with the European Union, but it's still nominally part of the European Union. And so it is reasonable that Hungary will play a pivot role, the role of negotiator and conciliator between Russia and Europe. Vladimir Putin certainly trusts Viktor Orban. Viktor Orban is a man, I do believe, in his late 60s, if, if I'm not mistaken. But the point is that, see, it's not merely Viktor Orban. He's been around so long that his whole team are on the same page. And they have probably built those long-standing and deep ties with Russia so that into the future, after Mr. Orban inevitably exits the stage, and I don't mean that in a, I hope he has a long and fruitful life, but we all end eventually. Once he has leave, left, rather, uh, Hungary will continue to be a major player. Hmm? A major player. And so, sorry about this, hang on a bit, a bit, I right, got just... And so, 
Victor, uh, Victor Orban and Hungary. Hungary, you should pay attention to. They are going to be that, that pivot country, okay? That place where Russia and Europe come to meet, okay? And of course, I think that Victor Orban, he's no fool. He's deliberately starting to position himself for precisely that role. And it'll be good for Hungary. Hungary will be in the driver's seat insofar as Europe and Russia, because the Europeans will try to curry favor with him uh, in order to have, you know, get in the good word with Russia, because the Europeans will eventually realize that this was a catastrophic decision to declare economic war against Russia, because Russia, uh, the Europe rather, needs Russia far more than Russia needs Europe, and they are suddenly realizing this. And uh, Viktor Orban will also be able to uh, get a lot of favors from Putin because Putin himself and the Russians will want to have somebody who can sweet talk the Europeans into getting what the Russians want. See, so it's all good for Viktor Orban, you know, all good for Hungary, and yeah, and a big fuck you very much to the Euro weenies and the Eurocrats, which is always fun. Anyway. Now, Imran Khan is the uh, Prime Minister of Pakistan. Imran Khan is a famous, originally he was a famous cricket player, a very smart man, and he was a professional cricket player, but of course he parlayed his notoriety into uh, uh, political power. He also comes from, apparently, as I understand it, a very influential family in Pakistan. Anyway, um, he, basically the Americans were trying to regime change him, to call a revolution him. They were trying to get rid of him. Okay, because Imran Khan doesn't want to play ball with the Americans. And the Americans, it, it, it's like they're losing their minds because they are trying to regime change everybody. Kazakhstan, Russia, India, the calling for regime change in, 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 um, in, in Pakistan. You know, I mean, like everywhere, they're, they're going crazy. The, the, the Americans are going crazy because they are realizing that they're screwed that they made a catastrophic mistake insofar as declaring economic war with Russia. And they, they, they don't know, they don't have a reverse gear. They keep on doubling down, okay? And so what's going on with Imran Khan? Imran Khan was, uh, um, some of his people uh, defected and there was gonna be a vote of no confidence. This vote of no confidence was engineered by globalists, by Americans who were promising a lot of the opposition figures, you know, a lot of different things. They literally went out and said that if they got rid of, if the Americans said to the Pakistanis that if they got rid of Imran Khan, they would forgive Pakistan for its, you know, previous behavior and, and try to, uh, you know, uh, make things easy for the new leader of Pakistan. And Imran Khan did a very clever thing. He uh, basically got the president of Pakistan, uh, who's a, a, a political figurehead, like the queen or something, to um, rule that the vote of no confidence was illegal, and he, um, the president, called for new elections. New elections are going to happen in 90 days. And so basically, he, Imran Khan, by way of calling new elections, he stuck a knife through the heart of of this, um, of this uh, regime change that they were trying to pull on him, okay? He just like stuck it. Hmm? Now, what's gonna happen because of this? What is going on? Uh -huh. Anyway, um, sorry, you don't hear it probably, but it's just some noise here that's kind of like distracting me. Anyway, the point of this is that it's not that Imran Khan bought himself 90 days. It's that the thing that he's doing actually today is that he called for an anti-American rally. <laughs> he's deliberately, and, and also there's something else too, um, the Pakistani military, which enjoys very, uh, very high prestige and is thought of very well, very highly by the Pakistani people, uh, they um, released information that it seemed that there was a plot to assassinate Imran Khan. Assassinations, unfortunately, in, in Pakistan and India are quite common. Benazir Bhutto was assassinated fa uh, quite famously a few years ago, or several, a couple of decades ago now. I forget how, when she was assassinated, but it's not important. The, the important point is that, see, political assassination is no joke. And when they say that they uncovered a plot, uh, you know, to assassinate Imran Khan, it's <laughs> probably real, okay? I mean, these guys, they don't screw around. And so the point is that, see, there is the perception in Pakistan that all of this is regime change because uh, Pakistan realizes that its future is with China and with Russia, okay? And so the reason that the Americans were putting all this pressure on Imran Khan 
to the point where they were willing to get rid of him and pushing to get rid of him uh, is because Imran Khan didn't want to impose all these sanctions on Russia. And the Americans are creating the conditions whereby or you're with us or you're against us. There's no middle ground. Clearly Pakistan and clearly India, which is more or less in the same boat, and I'll get to it in just a moment, both of these countries, they have very, very strong, long-standing ties with Russia. They are right next door to Russia. Russia matters to them. Russia provides them with food, with energy. They don't want to piss off the Russians, okay? And so they don't want to impose these sanctions, mm -hmm. but they don't want to piss off the Americans either. I mean, so it's, it's a delicate balancing act for both Pakistan and India. But the United States has this stupid idea that, you know, you're with us or against us, which is juvenile. I'm an adult man. Say I'm friends with you, but we have a, a, a third person here, you know, John Smith. And John and you are really good friends. And I hate John, you know, because, I don't know, you know, because I just don't like him, you know? He talks funny, whatever. And so I hate John, but I'm friends with you, and you're friends with John. Does that mean that I have to hate you now? No, I'm an adult, okay? I mean, I don't want to talk to John Smith. I think he's a moron, an idiot, a bastard, blah, 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 blah. And you think he's aces, but you and I can have a perfectly fine relationship even as I continue my enmity with John Smith, who is your friend, you see? Only children, middle schoolers, behave in this way that, oh, you're friends with him? Then I can't be friends with you. Only middle schoolers, immature people, stupid people, think this way. And this is the level of the American government. The American government told Pakistan, either you're with us or you're our enemy. And, you know, Pakistan has interest with Russia Na relations between nations are always complicated. They're always just a whole bunch of different levels going on, okay? And so it's impossible to, to you know, y you have to understand. And the Americans just refuse to understand uh, the needs of Pakistan. And so they decided that they were going to get rid of Imran Khan, figuring that they'd regime change Imran Khan, and the next regime would do what they want just as they tried to regime change Viktor Orban, and it blew up in their face because the, the Hungarian people clearly liked what Viktor Orban was saying, that is, be friends with, with Russia, protect our national interests. Imran Khan is saying, be friends with Russia, protect our national interests. And the Americans, just like with Viktor Orban, they're like, no, no, no. They tried to regime change him. They probably were behind or mixed up with the plot to assassinate him. And so what's going to happen in the next 90 days? Im Imran Khan is going to bang the drum relentlessly about how America wants to interfere in Pakistani affairs. And no country likes it when some other country interferes with their domestic affairs. Imran Khan is going to win this election by a landslide, and he's going to have things firmly in hand. And why? It's because of the Americans. The other thing that's going to happen is that Imran Khan, Pakistan, and India have had long-standing disputes, problems, Kashmir, the whole bit, right? They've had problems for decades, ever since they were split up back in uh, 1949, right? What is going to happen now that both Pakistan are going to get is going to get sanctioned and also India is going to get sanctioned because the Americans are talking about sanctioning India because they don't like the fact that Prime Minister Modi in India is very close to Russia said in a speech recently in front of the Indian parliament that the relationships with Russia are decades old and they are very deep and that India will never turn its back on Russia because Russia was the only country that stood with India back in the 60s and 70s when India had no friends, which is true. And so they will never um, turn their back on Russia and they will never go along with the sanctions package. Mm -hmm. And so now the Americans are saying that they want to sanction India. Now, you know, the United States does a lot of business with India. Again, this shit is going to hurt the Americans far more than it's going to hurt the Indians. Mm -hmm. But they're pushing the sanctions. And so what's happening with India and Pakistan? They're burying the hatchet. <laughs> That's what's going to happen, okay? Whatever problems they have, and they currently have problems, as usual, principally water rights and other issues, and Kashmir is always forever Kashmir and just rock as far as I can tell, but anyway, that's not either here or there, the point. India and Pakistan. 
because they're both being pushed around by the Americans, it's going to be inevitable that they're going to find common ground. Because that's what's happening between India and China. Because India is seeing that it's on the sanctions escalator, and that wonderful phrase that uh, my friend Alexander Mercurius over the, at the Duran came up with, India is on the sanctions escalator, and China is on the sanctions escalator. And so what's happening? China and India are making friends. Mm -hmm. And they started to negotiate seriously about the differences that they have. Principally, those issues are water rights in the Him Himalayas. Mm -hmm. Because the water uh, flows uh, that originate in Chinese territory, the Chinese have been damming them to create uh, hydroelectric power, but the Indians need that water and they can't afford to have it dammed up because they need that water for irrigation. And so there's been the potential of enormous tension, as you can tell. I mean, between one country needing the water for electricity and the other country needing the water for food, I mean, dude, this is a recipe for war. But what's going to happen is that because the Americans are threatening both China and India with sanctions, both China and India are realizing that it is much better to solve these problems and get to a, an equitable solution. Also, what's going to happen is that, see, these sanctions are going to hurt the Chinese less than the Indians. But the Chinese, clever people, clever, clever people, they always know that sometimes, even when you're in a position of strength, it's better not to use that strength to screw over the other side in negotiations. Because at this time, the Indians need the Chinese more than the other way around, I mean, if we're being hand to heart, right? But just as the Chinese, when they negotiated with the Russians over the border disputes back in the 90s, when Russia was extremely weak, the Chinese didn't press their advantages, I suspect, this is just speculation, but I suspect <coughs> that in the interest of, of coming with a, an equitable deal, excuse me, <coughs> in the interest of coming with an equitable deal between uh, China and India, the, um, the Chinese are going to cede a lot of ground. Sorry about that. They're going to calculate correctly that if they squeeze India and get everything, the Indians will go along with it because they need the Chinese at this point. But it's going to be a very superficial, uh, a very super superficial bond, easily broken. Mm -hmm. Because right now there's the American pressure. That's why they're bonding. But once that pressure is removed and if China screws over India, then that bond will dissipate and there will be conflict. And so I think the Chinese will be wise and be thinking long term. And they'll be thinking, no, we're going to negotiate and we're going to try to be equitable, try to be very fair so that both sides walk away from the negotiating table feeling, yes, we got most of what we want because nobody gets everything that they want. But we got most of what we want and it was fair and it was decent and we were, you know, I mean, you know, you've been in negotiations, right? And I think the Chinese are going to do that. And that's going to be the start of a very strong relationship between India and China. I mean, China and India are already, you have a lot of bonds between them. They solve these border issues because of this American pressure. And it's only going to increase. Mm -hmm. Okay. And here we come to the inter interesting bit. If Pakistan and India feel the same way, and they start getting together, all of a sudden it's China, India, Pakistan, Russia, right? And soon enough, it'll be uh, um, Afghanistan, because the Afghani Afghanis are, you know, getting uh, their, the Taliban in Afghanistan is about to be recognized, or has been recognized actually, by the Russians, okay? And so, you know, the whole Eurasian continent, and soon enough, it'll, Iran will be part of the mix, okay? Iran, a key component. And all of a sudden, the Eurasian continent from Moscow all the way to Beijing. It's gonna be one thing. From Siberia all the way to Sri Lanka. And I bet that Sri Lanka is going through a whole mess. I'm gonna talk about it tomorrow. But I bet that as things evolve, a lot of issues are gonna be sorted out. A lot of uh, things are going to get smoothed out, and all of a sudden you're going to have a very coherent Eurasian landmass. And the Belt and Road Initiative, the Chinese have been pu pushing so long, and they've been so assiduous in, in fomenting, it's going to start paying off big dividends, okay? I mean, things are going to be looking up, okay? And it's going to leave Europe and the United States behind, see? Because who has the manufacturing? China and India. 
Who has the natural resources? The Russians and Iran. And what do the Europeans have? Pretty buildings and a service economy. What do the Americans have? Strip malls and a service economy. Uh, you see? <laughs> you see how it works? Huh? Uh, the future is Eurasia. Okay? And this conflict in Ukraine, it's just, it's just the start of this break. And I'm starting to realize that the American declaration of economic war against Russia with the sanctions and all this nonsense, it will be looked at retrospectively as one of the most catastrophic decisions ever that any large empire ever did. Because it's, it's the moment that the Americans broke their own system pointlessly, needlessly. Mm -hmm. Because by breaking uh, the contact between Russia and the West, see, by, by imposing complete sanctions that just broke you know, just put an iron curtain between uh, uh, Russia and Western Europe and the Americas. You know, all of a sudden, it's like a big weight off the off the minds of the Russians. Okay, and so you know, it, it, it's over. It's over. Okay. Now, um, to go back to this this break, you know, the Americans did something fucking nasty. I mean, as far as I'm concerned, it's, it's evil. They stole three hundred billion dollars of Russia's reserve. Mm -hmm. They stole it. Okay, it's not a default. A default is when you do not have the money to pay back. That's a default. But in this case, the money's there. The Americans simply stole it. It's it's not complicated, man. And the thing is that Ukrainians want that money. They, they're saying right now, the Minister of Finance of Ukraine saying that they want those uh, $300 billion. You know what they're going to do with it. They're going to steal it. They're going to steal all of it. Okay. The Ukrainian oligarchs, Zelensky, all these goons, they're going to steal that money. The Americans and Europeans, they're also going to steal that money. That's what they're planning on doing, okay? And uh, the, the Russians, they're not stupid. They must have realized, you know, this is going to happen. I mean, before the war, before they pulled the trigger on the war, they must have realized this is going to happen. They're going to steal our money, and they're going to fritter it away. They do God knows what with it, and they're going to do it. They're going to steal it, you know? And that's just so low, such a low thing. And all this bullshit talk about, you know, how, how the, the United States is human rights and all this bullshit about the rule of law and blah, blah, blah. Just fucking thieves, man. That's what they're going to do. And, and the Bidens and the, the Bidens of the world, the, the, the whole corrupt cabal of the European Union, the, the dictatorship by bureaucrats that exist there, they're all going to stick their snouts in the trough of Russian money that they stole. You know, the Russians are going to make that money back. Right. But it's, it's low, man. It's just incredibly low, dude, but they're going to do it. I mean, the, the, the Ukrainians are, are complaining that they want that money to rebuild their country, blah, blah. And the Europeans and the Americans are going to figure out some mechanism to do exactly that in name. And they're going to figure out a way to siphon off, you know, at least, the bureaucrats of Ukraine, the European Union, and the United States. And they're going to come up with all kinds of excuses and this and that. They'll come up with reparations and all this bullshit. None of that money is going to get to Ukraine. None of it. Okay? It's all going to wind up in the pockets of these corrupt bureaucrats and the corrupt American administration. Yeah, that's what's going to happen. Yeah. If you're in the West, yeah, you are ruled by kleptocrats. Mm. And that's the truth. Uh, anyway, let's talk about the war in Ukraine. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, the first thing I want to talk about is uh, Bucha. Mm -hmm. Bucha is bullshit. It's just complete bullshit. Okay. Uh, it's absolutely positively clear that the Russians had cleared out of Bucha in their uh, strategic uh, redeployment on the 30th of March. Okay. The 31st of March. The mayor of Bucha said that they had complete control of the city, that uh, Ukrainian forces could come in, and that everything was hunky-dory. And there were no bodies on the street. And because if there had been bodies on the street on the 31st, he would have said so. I mean, come on. You saw those video images. The bodies were all over the goddamn place, right? Now, it's very clear because that so many of these bodies, they had white armbands, which is the way that the Russians, uh, uh, the Russians used white armbands to signal that they were friendlies. Mm -hmm. And the uh, Ukrainians uh, have blue, or sometimes yellow. Now, it's clear that all these people were assassinated. They were uh, kidnapped, 
taken someplace, shot, probably tortured. And then their bodies were, you know, dumped very photogenically in different places, okay? Uh, there's no question that it was the Ukrainians. No question. And why is there no question? Because the Ukrainians have done it before. Simple as that. The Ukrainians have lots of times done that. On my Twitter feed, Real Gonzalo Lira, which I'm still locked out of and for a few more days, uh, you know, on the first pinned tweet, there are the names of people who've been kidnapped, many of them assassinated from that list. Some of them are still, you know, held by SBU thugs and who God knows who. But uh, yeah, and insofar as Mariupol, the Russians did it. And there are so many testimonials of civilians in Mariupol who said that the Ukrainians did it, that the Ukrainians shot at civilians, used civilians as human shields, tied up, tortured civilians, murdered them in cold blood while they were tied up and dumped them wherever. So many accounts that it, it, it's not a psyop, it's real, okay? And as I've told you, uh, I personally know two people, personally, okay? Now, these people have family in Mariupol and they have told me that they have told me that their parents or, or, or close relatives, very close relatives, uh, were experienced being shot at by Ukrainian soldiers. Okay, so it's not like, you know, and of course, you know, who am I? Maybe I'm making this up. Okay, fine, I'm making it up. But how come all of these video testimonies pretty much back this up? You go on Telegram and you just um, put Mariupol human rights abuses and you'll find a whole bunch of videos, man. It's incredible. Okay, it's all over the place. You know? And why would the Russians, who've been in, in uh, Bucha for like four weeks, and they allowed everybody to use their cell phones to send selfies and Facebook and all that good crap, right? For all those weeks, they were like there for four weeks. They never interfered with the civilian population. They never killed anybody, mm -hmm. any civilian, okay? Uh, there was, Bucha was a hard fought neighborhood uh, but once the Russians had captured it, they never messed with the civilians. The biggest thing that happened was that a lot of times uh, Russian soldiers would swap some of the foods they had for some fresh food. You know, dried goods that they'd get, you know, for their rations for like, you know, fresh milk or fresh cheese and shit like that. I mean, you're trivial, right? And not even contraband per se, just swapping between civilians and soldiers and it's perfectly acceptable. Anyway, the Russians never abused the civilians, never, okay? And then on the last day, they're going to shoot a bunch of people, you know, apparently 400 people. They're going to shoot 400 people who had been helping them distribute humanitarian aid in that neighborhood. That doesn't make any damn sense. It doesn't make any goddamn sense. It doesn't make any sense at all, okay? I think the mistake that the Russians made was that they should have emphasized to these people, look, you helped us. You're going to be targeted by these crazies. Get on these buses and we will take you with us to wherever you want to go. Okay? I think that that was the lone mistake that the Russians made. Mm -hmm. That they should have evacuated these people because apparently these people were killed because they were considered to be collaborators. Because they had assisted the Russians in distributing humanitarian aid. They had uh, done this trivial, trivial uh, trading commerce, which is trivial because it wasn't even with cash. It was just, you know, swapping stuff. Um, you know, this trivial kind of thing, and out of anger, out of uh, the fact that they're losing the war, which I'll get to in just a moment, uh, all of this stuff, they just lashed out, okay? They lashed out the, the Ukrainians, not the Russians. The Russians, didn't, the Russians did not do this, period, okay? There's something else, too. Yesterday, I did a video about this, you know, Bucha more lies, and I floated the possibility that may, they might have been mannequins, because some of them look so weird. Mm -hmm. They look stiff. And now I realize what must have happened. They must have been shot elsewhere. Mm -hmm. They were shot elsewhere. And they started uh, suffering rigor mortis. And then later they were moved and dumped in the street. And because of rigor mortis, some of their limbs were still stiff. And they looked like mannequins. They, they looked stiff, okay? Because they were starting to stiffen up because of rigor mortis, okay? I think that that's what my hindbrain must have picked up. And that's why I thought, oh, you know, they look like mannequins. No, they weren't mannequins. It's that they were starting to stiffen up from when they were shot before. Because it seems, it seems that they were um, taken to uh, different places, different locations underground, uh, tied, and of course tied up before. They were tortured and shot. And then their bodies were removed from these killing areas and then moved over outside and placed in specific areas and dumped.
Now, I've also seen some videos, uh, very interesting videos, of like somebody filming from far away as Russian soldiers shoot these civilians. Okay, and it's very grainy and it's very from far away. Like, you know, when you zoom in with your phone, right? And there's like heavy breathing and then these people are shot, right? You know what it reminded me of? It reminded me of Lonely Girl 15. Those of you who are old school internet uh, dweebs like me will remember Lonely Girl 15. Lonely Girl 15, way back. I, I'm gonna, I mean, it must have been 2006, 2000, something like that. Uh, I mean, 15 years ago at least. Lonely Girl 15 was the first viral sensation. It was this girl who did these videos and very compelling videos. And she seemed to belong to some sort of satanic cult, right? It turned out to be like a whole just hoax, okay? She was a professional actress, not some 15-year-old girl. And um, it, was, it, was, it was just entertaining. I remember watching and I was like, Jesus, this is really compelling crap, right? And a lot of people were watching these videos, you know? It was on YouTube back in the day, and, and in the end, it was just a big hoax, okay? But some of the videos were like that, were like filmed from far away, and you could hear the, the, the sound of, of breathing, of like, you know, fear on the part of the person filming this, this distant event. And I thought, man, this is just like Lonely Girl 15. The whole Bucha thing is bullshit. I, I think actually the name of it, Bucha, I think it was deliberately chosen because it sounds like butcher in English, butchery. I mean, I wouldn't put it past these fuckers, okay? These, these people are masters at manipulation, okay? And, and they're such cynical scumbags. One of these guys, I, I, I forget the name of the guy, uh, Aronovich or something like that. I, I, I posted on my Telegram feed. You know, uh, Patrick Lancaster, whom I admire tremendously. And if Patrick, you're listening, you are aces, my man. You are just all kinds of cool. Patrick Lancaster, a few days ago, uh, a little less than a week ago, he was in Mariupol and he came across a dead girl who had been tortured and raped and murdered. And they'd uh, sort of like cut or smeared. It's, it's unclear what kind of wound she had because clearly like blood, probably her own blood. And also, but like cut and burned, it was clear, but they had carved in her belly and chest uh, swastika. Mm -hmm. I mean, really disgusting and despicable. And, um, and Patrick uh, filmed that, you know, it's very powerful. And it, it must have weighed on Patrick quite a bit. It certainly weighed on me as, a, as, a, as just somebody who saw it, okay, saw the video him being there must have been shocking to him, you know? And so anyway, um, this this um, blogger, advisor to Zelensky, you know, some crazy ass neo-Nazi lunatic, right? Uh, he was the guy who did this video, uh, this advisor to Zelensky did this video where he admired ISIS and, and said how ISIS was just wonderful what they did. Okay, just a crazy guy. He took Patrick Lancaster's uh, uh, a still from Patrick Lancaster's footage and claimed that it was uh, um, a woman, a Ukrainian woman, killed by Russians in um, Gosmel or someplace, in, in some place around uh, Kiev, when of course it was a Ukrainian woman who had been killed in Mariupol by Ukrainian forces, I was of battalion forces, indisputably, okay? I mean, think how cynical, it's such a cynical bastard to, to take something that his own people had done a victim of his own disgusting neo-Nazi thugs and pass it off as having been done by Russians. And, and, you know, oh, poor us, you know, how cynical, how evil, you know, I mean, really evil. Mm -hmm. It's on my Telegram channel. Go check it out. It's one of the last posts I made uh, before this broadcast. Okay. So anyway, the whole Bucha thing, screw that. That's all Russian. And it's, and it's all like desperation because what's going on is that See, the Ukrainians are losing and everyone knows it insofar as the professional militaries around the world. Every Ministry of Defense, Defense Department, everybody in Europe and, and certainly China and India, and all the professional military men, they know that it's over. Okay, now why is it over? Well, because the Russians, see, they destroyed the ability of the Ukrainian army to move. They destroyed all of their uh, gasoline and they destroyed God knows how much of their uh, munitions depots. Um, they destroyed their uh, air, air cover and air defenses. Mm -hmm. uh, and most important of all, they have destroyed the command and control ability of the 
uh, Ukrainian armed forces. So the Ukrainian armed forces are just basically pockets of soldiers distributed throughout the country without any coherence. They can't mount a coherent defense. They're simply reacting. And since they're running out of gas and running out of munitions, then they're basically just sitting ducks. See? See, the Russians are, are carrying out a, a strategic withdrawal from Kiev, um, from uh, uh, Chernihiv, uh, and they are moving over to the Donbass region, and also from Mariupol. Now, this is taking time because it takes a long time to move, you know, tens of thousands of troops, you know, 40,000 troops from Mariupol, right? And another 50,000 troops from northern Ukraine. It takes time to pull them out, to resupply them, get the men rested, you know, redirect the uh, leaders into recognizing the new strategic objective and getting every, everybody in the mental headspace to go about achieving that. Um, that's why I've been paying a lot of attention to Scott Ritter, who's been describing this, these things, because we who are not in the military do not understand that in an industrialized military operation like this is, it takes a long, long time to get everything ready and organized because it's huge, it's huge numbers. We're talking 40,000 men in the South and at least the same number in the North, 80,000 men to organize all their gear, all their equipment, tanks, armored personnel carriers, trucks, gasoline trucks, all kinds of crap that they have to move to get ready for this final battle. And the final battle, battle is gonna be around the area of Krematorsk, okay? Uh, near the contact line with the Donbass. And that is basically, it's a pincer move, encirclement move of between 60 and 100,000 Ukrainian troops. Now those men are gonna be slaughtered. And the only thing that will prevent that is the unconditional surrender of the Ukraines. Now that will not happen because the thugs around Zelensky will murder him, literally. I don't mean that figuratively. I mean that they will literally murder him and his family if he surrenders. Because, see, these people, they know that if they surrender, the Russians will kill them. Hmm? Because that's what the Russians did in Mariupol. Mariupol was the stronghold of the Azov Battalion. And the Russians went in and wiped out 15,000 of these fighters. Hmm? Just wiped them out. Just murdered them. And you say, oh, yeah, but there are like 4,000 that are still in the steelworks thing, in that enormous complex down in Mariupol. And it, by the way, it's enormous. I mean, you look it up on, on uh, Wikipedia or, or whatever, it's huge. It's like the Stalinist enormous facility, you know, steelworks. Um, Azov Stal, okay? Stal meaning steel, Azov because of the Sea of Azov. And that's where the Azov Battalion, Azov, the name comes from the Sea of Azov, which is that little uh, a sea to the east of Crimea. Now, the Azov Battalion is there, the remains of it. Nobody's really sure how many are left over, something like 3,000, 4,000, something like that. And they're all holed up in that enormous facility. And the Russians are again, just slugging it out, taking their time about it. But of course, when you have an encircled little group of 3,000, 4,000 men that do not have the possibility of being relieved or resupplied with food or water or munitions, it's just a matter of time, okay? And so you don't need to have 50,000 men as they had when they attacked Mariupol initially. 10,000 men is enough to do the job. Just surround them and wait them out. And whenever, you know, whenever you feel like you just like squeeze them in a little bit more. But if you came in with 50,000 men, right? And you only need 10,000 men for this last mopping up of these last, of these Nazi scumbags, well, then that leaves you 40,000 men who can go off and, you know, find trouble elsewhere, which is what they're doing. They're heading up north to Donetsk. They're going to hit Donetsk, and, and they're going to rest and resupply and just get reorganized. And like I said, it takes time. But what they're going to do is that they're going to rest up, and then they're going to go for the final battle. And this final battle, they've surrounded, the Russians have surrounded in a pincer move, an encirclement move, essentially between 60,000 and 100,000 soldiers. Nobody's really sure because, of course, the armies that are in battle know exactly how many men there are, but they're not really telling, or when they tell, they lie. And so it's because it's part of the intelligence thing and it's part of war, right? But the important thing is that, see, that's the, uh, that will be the battle. Now, if the Zelensky regime 
was decent, mm -hmm. they'd surrender because they can't win. It's just not possible. And what you have right now is that you have this big pocket of men. I mean, remember, all these pockets, they are not in communication with one another, at least not secure military communication, because those lines of communication were broken by the Russians. And they have no, no possibility of resupply, no fuel. The Russians destroyed their fuel depots, destroyed even the refineries. And that happened just like, like last week. They destroyed the refinery, I mean, uh, just a couple of days ago, rather. They destroyed, uh, two days ago, the refinery just south of Dnipropetrovsk. And yesterday, they destroyed the refinery by uh, Odessa. There's no possibility of producing more gasoline for these tanks. And the oil is, the gasoline is all gone. Fuel is gone for, for the Ukrainians, for the Russians, they got plenty, okay? From Russia, of course, on, on their own logistic support, right? But the Ukrainians do not have any gasoline. An army without gasoline, a, a tank without gasoline is just, you know, a big tchotchke, okay? It's pointless, useless, okay? And they're running out of munitions for the same reason, because the Russians have been destroying their munitions, right? And, you know, you say, well, the Americans want to resupply them, the Europeans want to resupply them. Okay, sure. The, um, as I understand it, the Russians have destroyed something like 2,000 tanks. I mean, basically all of the uh, uh, tanks that the Ukrainians had, okay? They're gone. And uh, the Americans are looking around all over Europe desperately for old uh, T-72 Russian tanks, and they're coming up with like something like 50 or 60 of these tanks. What the hell are you gonna do with that? Nothing. Okay, it's over. It's the, the war is over. Okay, and you know, even the Germans are saying, you know, well, we're not really going to send you more weapons because what's the point? It's over. You have pockets of soldiers and resistance in, um, uh, you know, near the contact line of Krematorsk, Donetsk, that area. Around Odessa, you have a big pile of, of soldiers. Around Kiev, okay, and a few around Kharkov, here where I am. Now, what's going to happen to these pockets? Well, See, the Russians, one way or another, are going to neutralize that big bulge, that big pocket in uh, southeast Ukraine, okay, around Donetsk, you know, the Kramatorsk, what I've been talking about. They're going to neutralize it, one way or the other. And what's going to happen is that there's going to be some desertion, there's going to be some surrender, and some death. That, that's it. You know, desertion, surrender, or death. That's it. And... I suspect that it's going to be a lot of death, you know, because the propaganda has been so intense that it gives a lot of these poor soldiers the illusion that they can still win, okay, the hope that they can still win. I mean, that's why the Azov fighters, for instance, are still fighting, because they have the illusion that somehow some miracle will happen. No miracle will come. Miracles don't happen, okay? Sorry. You know, and you uh, Christ bros, sorry, pal, there is no such thing as a miracle, okay? And it ain't going to happen. There is no miracle is going to... And so that's why the Ukrainian PR machine is going to overdrive with this Bucha shit, okay? Relentlessly claiming that the Russians did it. And it's obvious that they didn't. You know that saying, it's all over but the shouting? Yeah. The Bucha thing, and there's going to be some more bullshit. That's the shouting. It's all over, okay? But because of this shouting, these poor soldiers are going to continue to fight, and they're going to die needlessly. And that is a fucking tragedy. It is, it is a cat catastrophic tragedy because these young men who are going to be killed pointlessly, they are the future of Ukraine. And when you kill these young men, you kill the future of Ukraine. And also what happens is that, see, it makes the Russians far less likely to give up any terrain that they conquer. I've said from the beginning, and I still believe that they are going to wind up taking Kharkov and perhaps the Poltava Oblast, but that's 50-50. But certainly all of the eastern provinces, Lugansk, Donetsk, everything along the southern uh, coast of Ukraine, you know, all the way to Odessa. They're going to take it all. And they're going to either create a puppet state called Novorossiya, or they're going to just flat out integrate it into Russia. And the way that they are organizing things in Kherson, raising the Russian flag, obliging everybody to use rubles. I mean, very, being very polite about it, you know, and exchanging people's grievances for rubles, but insisting that they use rubles for all their transactions. It just seems that they're going to just absorb the, these areas. It's going to be part of Russia. Simple as, simple as that. And the Ukrainian rump state is going to be 
possibly, possibly with Kiev, but not necessarily. And it could be that they partition Kiev. Yeah. And uh, it'll be all this rump state from, you know, Kiev west, all the way to Lviv. Assuming, of course, that the Poles don't decide that they want Lviv for themselves, right? But that remains to be seen. The point, the serious point here. Um, it's over. It's over. And this big battle that's about to happen and all these young men who are going to die, the Russians have made up their minds because there's something else too, of course, as I've said um, before. The shooting of the POWs, the, of the Russian POWs by the Ukrainian armed force, shooting them in the knees, shooting them in the groin, shooting them in the femoral artery, leaving them to bleed out and die in incredible pain. Uh, the Russian public saw that. And between the sanctions and between that brutal and absolutely positively true footage, because they found where it was, they found everything. I mean, it's, it's true. It was, those atrocities happened and they were committed against Russian POWs and there's no doubt about it. That has just made the Russians just adamant that they're going to win this fucker. They're going to win it no matter what it takes. You know, I was talking to some um, uh, uh, acquaintances in Russia. And they were saying that people in Russia have this attitude that the war is going to last at least until the end of the year, possibly right on to the end of next year. I mean, they're, they're resigned. They're like, yeah, it's going to take a long time. And what's really fascinating is that the pro-Western educated classes of Russia now hate the West because of the sanctions. See? Because these pro-Westerns, you know, the, the more educated people, the people who, uh, you know, who advance their careers by way of brain power, you know, who design stuff and manage stuff, those people, you know, who web design and, you know, all kinds of computer programming crap, right? That class of people in Russia who were all pro-Western and who sort of like looked askance at uh, Vladimir Putin, right? Because of the hysterical sanctions, all of those people now reject the West and they have turned to Putin. See, if Putin had tried to divorce those people from the West, there would have been all kinds of conflict internally in Russia and Putin probably would have lost. But because the West decided to divorce itself from Russia and including this large bourgeois class of highly educated people, the, the well-off people, the, the, you know, uh, uppity middle classes, you know, of Russia. Since the West decided to cleave itself away from those people, those people now look at the West and despise them because they look at their, their loss of uh, revenue, their loss of their good fortune. Huh? They're having to change their lives radically in order to adjust to this new situation. They don't view it as Putin's fault. They view it as the West's fault. You see? And, and, you know, and the only people who are still pro-Western, you know what they're doing? They're leaving Russia. <laughs> so by way of the Western sanctions against Russia, Putin managed to get all of the formerly pro-Western Russians onto his side and hate the West. And the ones who still like the West got them to leave. And he didn't push them. They're running away. Hmm? So he's going to have even more political support. I mean, right now, his numbers at, are at 83, and uh, that's the 83 approval rating. And that's from, uh, um, what you call it, uh, uh, um, a, a polling firm that is kind of like anti-Putin. I mean, not pro-Putin at all, okay? If you tell me that, you know, in a, while, in a little while's time, they have like a big victory in this upcoming battle, that the approval rating hits, you know, 90, 95%, wouldn't be a bit surprised, see? So the big battle is coming up, okay? This big, big battle, and the Russians are going to win it because they're going to throw everything at it. And remember, they're still operating with just 190,000 troops here. Of course, they've taken some losses. In the West, they have this bizarre belief that the Russians have lost like 30,000 dead, if they had 30,000 dead, that would mean that they would have at least an additional 60,000 casualties. 
and, and possibly as high as 90,000, because it's usually two to three times casualties to killed in action, right? And so that would mean that between, let's just say, that's low end, it's only 60,000 casualties, okay, uh, wounded in action, and 30,000 killed in action. That would be 90,000. That would be half, roughly half, of the total army that the Russians deployed in Ukraine. They would not be combat effective. They would be just a disorganized mess. And of course, that's not the case. So the, these, you know, crazy dreams, the propaganda, the bullshit, Okay, well, it leads you to all kinds of false assumptions as to the reality on the ground. Hmm? And a lot of people who are listening to my broadcast are saying that, no, I'm totally wrong, that the Ukrainians are winning. I mean, they took back these towns, right? They took back Bucha, right? They took it back. No, they didn't take it back. They didn't win it. The Russians left. <laughs> and they left for a very good reason. And I said from the very beginning that, and, and oh, man, I got a lot of shit. Well, I got kicked out of my hotel in Kiev because of it. I told you guys that military historians are going to look back on this invasion as one of the most brilliant in military history. And it is. And you like it or not, it is. They fucking played this goddamn right. They fucking played it. And they did it in a way that was so humane, okay? Because they didn't destroy the whole goddamn country. There are a lot of places that have been destroyed. Mariupol, for instance. Some of the outskirts here in Kharkov. A lot of neighborhoods outside of Kharkov got hit really bad, but it wasn't because the Russians wanted to. It's because the Ukrainian armed forces started hiding among the civilian population. And so they became a legitimate target. Like that big shopping mall in Kiev, right? It was empty. And the Russians, you know, for no reason whatsoever, blew it sky high. And then a little bit later, it's like, oh yeah, well, you know, it turned out that they had like a, like a, um, like, like a whole bunch of weapons and vehicles there in the mall. And that's why the Russians hit it and hit it hard to destroy all that crap, right? I mean, they turned it into a legitimate military target. See, the Russians aren't hitting civilians just for the hell of it, okay? They're not, that's a lie. They are hitting any civilian structure that's housing Ukrainian military forces. And the Ukrainians have been deliberately putting military forces among the civilians, deliberately so as to draw Russian fire so that they can win the PR war. Mm -hmm because of the crazy-ass neo-Nazi insane leadership that Russia, that uh, Ukraine has. Hmm? So anyway, um, the big battle is about to happen, and, but it's going to take some time. Because these things, like I said, it's not easy. Now, the Russian hysteria in the West is just going to keep on ramping up. And they're talking about like even more sanctions. How, what more sanctions can you do? You, you already you know, shot your wad. What else is there for you to do? Hmm? But they're insisting that they're going to do even more sanctions, more sanctions. We have to sanction them. Just fucking dumb. Why does the West hate Russia so much? And that's like the real point of this um, discussion. Well, there are multiple reasons. Okay. Now I'm going to outline them all, just like enumerate them one at, uh, all at once. And then I'm going to discuss each of them in turn. The first one is a Cold War hangover because the West was so used to hating on Russia for so long during the Cold War that it continued. The second is it's an easy excuse. And this started with Hillary Clinton. You know, anything bad going your way, the Russians did it. You know, the dog ate my homework kind of excuse, right? Third reason, ancient ethno-religious hatreds that go back more than a century because of shit that happened during the Imperial Russian period, uh, before the Bolshevik Revolution, you know, uh, uh, pogroms against the Jewish population way back when that have influenced to this day American leaders. Hmm? Uh, greed. This is a big issue. See? That there are people in the West that want to go back to the good old days when they could just rape Russia and take what they wanted from Russia and they want to go back to that. And the example is Ukraine. And I'm going to get to that in a second, but you have to understand there are a lot of people in the West who they only see Russia as a gas tank with nukes, a gas station with nukes rather. And they want to steal that gas. They want to steal the resources. They want to steal from Russia. They do. And it's in their hearts. And what I mentioned before, how Ukraine wants to steal Russia's $300 billion reserve that was stolen by the Americans. And they want to divvy it up between themselves. You know, it's thieves. Thieves splitting up the spoils because the Westerners are thieves. The empire of lies is an empire of thieves. It's the truth. And if you're American and you don't like it, 
Well, what do you call it when a country steals $300 billion of somebody else's money? Hmm? Steals it. That's theft. Huh? And don't give me this bullshit that, oh, it's sanctions, you know, and fuck you, okay? If, you know, you give me 300, uh, uh, you know, you give me $300, just 300 bucks, right? And I'm like, oh, you know, you know, we have a fight between us, right? And I say, well, you know, we had this fight, so fuck you, I'm not going to pay you back your money. You'd be like, fuck you, you stole, you know, I lent you that money, you have to give it back. I'd be like, no, we have a fight, I'm going to sanction you, fuck you, I'm not going to give you back your money. Done. You'd say, that dude stole my fucking money. I mean, we had a falling out and all, but then the guy went and stole my money. Same thing. That's exactly what the West did. That's exactly what the United States did. They stole Russia's money. And now they want to give it away to Ukraine, but not really give it away. It's just going to be the mechanism so they can divvy it up like fucking thieves. And that's your leadership. If you're America, America, bro, you are led by thieves, buddy. So anyway, let's go back to why the West hates Russia so much. Let's go... See, um, the, cold, the first reason the Cold War hangover. See, you got to understand that between 1945 and 1991, uh, two successive generations of Americans, and I was one of them, were raised to hate the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union was the enemy. They had nukes. I remember in the 70s, in growing up in Southern California, we literally did duck and cover. We were taught, and it was like a regular thing. It was, it was done enough times that I remember it very clearly. You know, in the two different schools I went to, I went to Pinecrest Elementary School and Bedford Academy, I think it was called. Um, and um, in both of them, I was taught to hide under my desk in case of a nuclear attack. And they was said, they said, you know, in case of a nuclear attack, we have to, you know, duck and cover, you know. Yeah, I grew up with that. You know, 72, 73, 74, that, those years, yeah. I, I remember it very clearly. I mean... It's not that I remember it like, no, no, that happened. I remember it. That happened. Mm -hmm. And I remember in 84, by this time I was living in Chile, but there was this movie that came out that had a huge impact. It was called The Day After. It was with uh, Jason Robards. And it was, you know, a bunch of just regular, ordinary people in the United States. And what happened after a nuclear war? And it was horrifying. Okay, it scared the shit out of everybody. In Chile, it was a TV movie, but uh, like a lot of times happens with TV movies, uh, outside the United States, it was released theatrically, and I saw it in a theater, and it had a huge impact on me. I saw it the one time, and I still remember vividly some scenes of it, right? And, um, you know, radiation poisoning. The Jason Robards character, I think, had died of radiation poisoning. He was in his car when he saw some bomb go off, and he's like, ducked so he's, he didn't get blind but then later he died of the radiation poisoning it was just all kinds of horrible you know it was just really scary i mean all that shit was on people's minds okay during the 70s and the 80s and certainly in the 60s in 62 there was nearly a nuclear war over the cuban missile crisis right and so you know th that amount of fear stays in the soul okay it stays mm -hmm. if you've grown up with that kind of emotionality towards something stays in the soul. Mm -hmm. And so people my age, a little bit older, people who are now in positions of power, you know, uh, like I said, I'm, I'm roughly in the generation of people who are in positions of power, you know, some are a little bit older than me, some are a little bit younger, and, and we all carry that notion that the Russians are the enemy, the Russians have nuclear weapons. And rationally, we know that that's no longer the case. I mean, Russia does have nuclear weapons, but, you know, the idea that they're going to preemptively nuke the West, that's out the window, right? But we still have that thing, okay? So we, we're scared of them. Also, uh, something I didn't add uh, to this that I, I'll add right here. Um, there is a radically different mentality between the Russians and the West, and the Americans specifically. Because the Americans are consumeristic. They're always looking to the future. They want more. They want to get just, they want to consume more, have more, eat more, you know, everything more. Whereas the Russians have a more philosophical approach to things. They are, yeah. And they're also, the Americans always want to please one another and be nice to one another. And the Russians don't want to please anybody. They don't give a fuck about pleasing anybody. They're just indifferent to other people's opinion. And that makes the Americans nervous. See? I think, you know, th this is, of course, 
by definition, an extremely subjective topic. But I think that fundamentally, Americans are made extremely nervous by the fact that Russians do not give a shit what other people think of them. They just don't care, okay? And, and it's, it's something that is very Eastern European because in Ukraine it happens too. I mean, people dress nicely and they want to look good and you would say, well, that's to project out into the world a certain image so that people think of a certain way of them. Yes, but it's more like a projection of their mental image of themselves. Mm -hmm. They don't actually care about what other people think of them. They just don't give a shit. Mm -hmm. Of course, you know, your friends, you care about what they think and your family, sure, but at heart, they just don't really care. And the Americans are constantly obsessed with what other people think of them. Mm -hmm. It's very interesting. Yeah, that would be the second reason. The third reason to, that the West hates Russia so much is because Russia provides an easy excuse for all kinds of things. Anything bad that happens, the Russians did it. And this started really during, you know, with, with in the last 10 years or so, okay? Um, it started, I remember very clearly, with the whole, you know, email thing. The Democratic National Committee, all of a sudden, they had this huge email le leak. And Hillary Clinton and all her people started saying that the Russian hackers did it, okay? Russian hackers did it. You know, and, and, you know, whenever, you know, some website would go down or some ha problem would come up, it was always Russian hackers. And they went from being Russian hackers to being Russian KGB, okay, which is like the ultimate bad guy, villain kind of thing. And slowly it just became the Russians. The Russians are the bad guys. The Russians do everything. And, you know, during the Trump administration, you know, the, uh, the Trump administration was portrayed as an agent of Vladimir Putin relentlessly by the mainstream media. And of course, what happened was that, see, the people on the left in the United States believed this bullshit because they couldn't really accept the fact that Hillary Clinton was just a horrible candidate that nobody liked. So they had to concoct this notion, this mental gymnastics nonsense that the Russians had put Trump in power. And what was interesting was that the conservatives on hearing these outrageous charges, they thought, holy shit, this is so outrageous that maybe it's true. And so that's why the, the right, especially in the early years of the Trump administration, did not really defend Trump very much because they suspected, well, you know, it's so crazy that maybe it's true. Hmm? And they started looking at the Russians very, you know, as very sketchy characters. And the Russians had had nothing to do with it. Hmm? Then they really didn't. Okay. And eventually the, the right wing realized, no, it's all just nonsense. It's just baloney. Hmm? But it took a while. And, and, and that mentality remained. The Russians are bad. The Russians, right? Then we have to come up to a very thorny issue, which is an ancient ethno-religious hatred that some people have. I discussed this a little bit with Victoria Newland. Victoria Newland, whom I was the child of uh, uh, Sherwin Newland, who was in turn the child of Meyer Nudelman, who was a Jewish immigrant from a region just outside of Odessa who had been persecuted, you know, in the 1905 uh, pogrom. You know, in, in Russia, there were pogroms against Jews all the time. Mm -hmm. Because what would happen was that the Jews would be accepted, embraced in different regions in Russia. But over time, they would bring a lot of economic and financial benefit to that region, but always at a cost that that region would eventually just become so resentful of that they would rise up and persecute uh, Jews. And, and that was the historic cycle that happened repeatedly. And because of this, uh, this gentleman, Meyer Noodleman, I, I discussed the specific example of Meyer Noodleman, who was um, Victoria Newland's grandfather. Victoria Newland is the, is the queen bee, the wicked witch of the Washington insofar as... Um, Russia is concerned in Ukraine. She was the mastermind of the 2014 coup. And she is the person whom I believe is most likely the person driving the whole um, uh, Ukrainian operation right now. But anyway, Meyer Noodleman, you know, he uh, fled Russia because of this pogrom. And he fled Russia in 1907. He made it to the United States. And he never was able to assimilate. And, and this uh, resentment and anger passed it on to his uh, son. Uh, his son wrote a book about it, about how his father was so resentful and angry and abused him in all kinds of ways. 
And of course, that psychic weight was so egregious on Sherwin that when he was about 40 years old and his daughter, Victoria, was uh, I think around 10 years old or something like that, he you know, suffered a complete nervous collapse and wound up in a psychiatric hospital for over a year to the point that they were thinking, the, the, his doctors were thinking seriously of lobotomizing him. You know, that's how screwed up in the head he was. And that, of course, he ascribed directly to his father, uh, Meyer Noodleman, having, uh, you know, had to flee uh, Russia because of these pogroms. And that resentment passed on to Victoria Noodleman. It's quite obvious, you know. And that story is not unique. Mm -hmm. Of course, the details change. But, see, there are so many people who uh, descend, uh, so many people in positions of enormous power in the American establishment and the American bureaucracy and the different industries in America, uh, finance, entertainment, whose grandparents and great-grandparents were refugees from Russia, who were persecuted in Russia, be it fairly or not, that's irrelevant, they were persecuted, and they brought that resentment with them to the United States. And it found, you know, fertile ground in their children and their grandchildren and great-grandchildren even. And so now they uh, have this enormous hatred for Russia. Just, you know, and I understand that because, you know, as a Latin American, you know, uh, I come from Chile and we win our wars. <laughs> we don't lose them, okay? We've had wars with Peru and we've had wars with Bolivia. And we took a lot of territory. We stole a lot of territory from them. Let's, let's face facts. We stole all of the north of Chile from Peru and Bolivia in 1879. And some of my forefathers were instrumental in that theft. <laughs> and the thing is, see, in Peru and Bolivia, I met people there, lovely people. And, and you know, a couple of them told me, you know, look, you know, you're, you seem like a decent guy and all that. But, you know, I hate your fucking guts and I hope you die. I'm like, why? Because you're fucking Chilean. You stole our land. We'll never forgive you. Hmm? No, because in America, most average Americans, they have no memory. But most of the rest of the world, including certain ethno-religious groups, they have long memories. And like I said, in, you know, in Bolivia, yeah. I remember one time I was talking to uh, the, the, uh, the son of the uh, Bolivian ambassador to the United States. He went to uh, Dartmouth with me. There were two, two brothers, actually. They were twins, but not identical. Anyway, these two guys, uh, one time I was talking with one of them. He said, you know, we hate your guts because, you know, you stole our land. Mm -hmm. oh. Them's the breaks. I don't have any animosity towards Bolivia. Of course not, because I was on the winning side. <laughs> See, the losing side always has that animosity, especially when it loses so badly that it has to flee. That animosity, that rage and resentment endures through the generations and to pretend otherwise is just foolish because it's the truth because because we love our parents and we love our grandparents and when we see them angry and enraged over some injustice whether it's true or not it doesn't matter insofar as our love for our parents and grandparents we will believe them and if they are enraged by something we will take that rage and take it into our heart and it will become our fight our rage hmm? So there's that issue. Then there is the fifth issue, which is that a lot of people in the West, when the Soviet Union collapsed, they made a lot of goddamn money off of Russia. They went in there with their neoliberal policies and they stole. They stole, they stole. And see, this is really interesting. When you look at Ukraine and you look at Russia, they started at the same spot. In fact, Ukraine, you could argue, was a little bit ahead because it had a lot of industry, a lot of technology, aerospace, all kinds of interesting stuff that they were pursuing in Ukraine. And so they started, you know, at the starting blocks, you could argue that Ukraine was a little bit ahead. Okay? They started at the same spot in 1991, right? And what happened over the next three decades? Over the next three decades, what happened was that um, the, uh, uh, you know, Russia started improving, especially once Putin came into power in 1999, started radically improving and moving forward, pulling away. And Ukraine just started going down, 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 down. Why? Well, because you see, in Ukraine, the, the Western thieves, the neoliberal thieves, had their way with the country. 
They went into Ukraine. They supported the local oligarchs in Ukraine whose business it was to extract as much profit as possible and make themselves rich. And see, the Western bureaucrats of the European Union and of the United States, they steered money towards Ukraine. But, you know, they chopped off some of the money for themselves and they helped the oligarchs feed off of Ukraine to the enrichment of the oligarch, but also to the enrichment of the European bureaucrats and the American bureaucrats or politicians or whatnot. Hunter Biden is a classic example, but he's not the only one. There's the kid of Nancy Pelosi, the kid of uh, John Kerry, the kid of Mitt Romney. See, all these people, they, they fed off of Ukraine. And that's why Ukraine is a poor country. It shouldn't be a poor country. It should be a very rich country because it has everything to be rich. It has natural resources. It has tremendous agricultural resources. And most important of all, it has enormous human resources human potential. The people in Ukraine are educated, hardworking, lovely people, law-abiding, I mean, aces in all regards. And yet Ukraine is the per capita, the poorest country in Europe before the war, by the way, or perhaps they were the second poorest after Moldova. But you see my point. It should not be a poor country. And yet it is because of all the corruption and thievery. And see, Russia, well, they avoided this fate because of Putin. Putin prevented these Western bloodsuckers from leeching off of Russia, prevented these, these people from supporting the Russian oligarchs to feed off a Russian corpse. And as time passed and it became more and more obvious to the American and European leeches that they couldn't get their claws into Russia, they started hating on Putin more and hating on Russia more because why are they defying us? We want to suck all the riches out of Russia, and it would be even better if we got to break up Russia. Why are they resisting? It's like the Borg in Star Trek, you know? These crazy people in the West, in Europe, in the Americas, want to just suck everything out of Russia. And Putin and the Russians prevented it. And see, Putin and the Russians now can look at Ukraine and realize that would have been their fate had they not resisted in the way that they did. And quite frankly, had Putin not been there. Because Putin is the man most responsible for preventing Russia from becoming a bigger version of Ukraine. Because Ukraine, as much as I love it, and I love the people here, but Ukraine is a shithole. And it is a shithole. It is a corrupt shithole. Because of the West, the European and American bureaucrats and politicians who used it to siphon money to themselves, steal from the Ukrainian people, and break Ukraine and make it just a shithole. See? And Ukraine would have been Russia's fate. And that's the truth. See? And so these reasons, the, the, the anger of the West, it's, it's this mishmash of reasons. Because you always have to understand, see, see hatred, strong emotions, it, they're never monocausal. It's not just one thing. It's always a combination of things. And some course of action, the, the bigger the organization, be it a company or a nation, when they take a route, take a path, it's not because of the one reason. It's often just a combination of reasons, see? Because motivation, reasons for any uh, uh, action is always complex and it's always multifaceted. There are multiple strands on, on, on the rope pulling in a certain direction or other. Excuse me. <coughs> you have to understand that. Only, only simpletons think that there's just one cause. If you're an adult, if you are a, a, a man who understands that human beings have multiple motivations and that groups of human beings will have a geometric number of motivations, then it's very clear. If you are a child, if you're an immature imbecile, then you're like, oh, what's the reason? What's the one reason? Why, why are they doing this? Why are they behaving this way? You know, only retards, only children, only fools think this way, okay? Adults realize that there are multiple motivations. And insofar as the West hatred for Russia, there are multiple motivations. I've always, I mean, I've never understood it personally. Uh -huh. And so because I don't understand it, because I personally feel no animosity towards Russia at all, on the contrary, but think that Russia is wonderful, beautiful literature, you know, men of enormous 
titanic moral standing, I think, of Alexander Solzhenitsyn, you know, but also of Dostoevsky, whom uh, one could argue that Tolstoy perhaps was the greater artist, but mm, I think that Dostoevsky was the greater human being. But it's a trivial argument. Um, I mean, and Pushkin and all the rest. I, Russia's aces, as far as I'm concerned, you know. Uh, you know, the, the flower of 19th century literature came from Russia. Mm -hmm. And and the music, Prokofiev, you know, Tchaikovsky, I mean, all the wonderful, wonderful music. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, they are an enormous contributor to Western civilization. And the West, Western Europe, has treated Russia so shabbily for so long, you know. And so I think that it's actually beneficial to Russia that it's finally cleaving from Europe. And, and it was the West that has cleaved it. You know, the, rat, the West is, is the party that took the ax to the relationship and just chopped it at, chopped it and chopped it until it's broken. And it's irretrievably broken. You have to understand, the United States and Western Europe cannot roll back these sanctions. This is forever, okay? And it is in the long run, and not even the long run, it's the short run, let alone the medium and long run, in the short term, it's been beneficial to Russia. And in the long run, it's all kinds of beneficial. There's only upside. And the thing is, too, uh, just to tidy up this, um, this broadcast, the war is over. And NATO, it seems, nothing will cause NATO to join. Uh, uh, fingers crossed. But I think that the window of opportunity for NATO to join in this fight and, and to fight the Russians on Ukrainian soil, I think that that window has passed. Thank God. I mean, thank God. I, I, I hope and pray that I'm not wrong on this. I can be wrong on everything else. I don't mind. But this, I hope that it does not happen. Because if the war widens, it will be a catastrophe for humanity. I mean, let alone Ukraine, let alone for myself personally here in Kharkov. It would be a catastrophe for humanity. It would be the end, man. And so I, I hope and pray to God that I am right on this, that it seems, seems you know, knock on wood, that um, that NATO will not join this fight and that they've recognized that it's over. I hope so, you know, and that, you know, Bucha and any other alleged atrocity, which will be all bullshit, because the Russians, they, they don't have any motivation to do any of this shit. It doesn't make any sense, okay? But let's just hope that all this shit just becomes just noise, just the shouting in, in the famous phrase, it's all over but the shouting because it is over, okay? So anyway, I hope that you enjoyed this broadcast. Like I said, this is the first of this uh, new series. What time is it? 6.30? I've gone for um, almost an hour and a half. I think that's a, a goodly length. Uh, yeah. I hope you enjoyed this first broadcast of uh, News and Views. Mm -hmm. And like I said, it's just going to be like this mis mishmash of stuff that's going on and what I think of them. And see, ultimately, what I think about whatever view, or whatever you know news item appears, it's not so much whether I'm right or wrong, okay? What's important, as far as I'm concerned, is for you to think through the position that I present and agree or disagree. Now, if you agree, that's great, but I much prefer you disagree because when you disagree, it obliges you to think, and that's the important thing. It seems to me that the service that I'm trying to provide is not to, you know, have a scorecard like, oh, I'm right, okay? Although it was very satisfying to know that I was right about James Vasquez, you know what I'm saying? But anyway, um, you know, a little, uh, apart from that little ego boost, but the reality, the, the truth, and this is a very serious point that I want to make. Uh, the problem with the West is that we don't think enough. Mm -hmm. Well, if you disagree with me, okay, articulate it. Well, if only to yourself, say, well, why is this Lyra fellow wrong and write it out and try to figure out why I'm wrong and, and articulate for yourself the reasons that you think I'm wrong, okay? Because ultimately the problem that we're having in the West is that we're not thinking enough. We're just, you know, just rote repeating because we're too polite to disagree with one another. And so either we throw a little hissy fit tantrum and deplatform people and just shut the door, block them, you know, just refuse to engage, or we assiduously agree with everything that they say. Insofar as my broadcasts are concerned, you don't have to agree with everything I say. 
No, not at all. You can disagree with everything I say, so long as you have good reasons. So long as you come up with good reasons that are logical, that make sense with the information that's available, okay? If you disagree and it's reasonable, then you are getting somewhere. But if you just disagree because you don't like what I have to say, but you have no logical arguments, then who's at fault? Me or you? You're at fault. And you want to be that person, be that nincompoop who just like, ew, I don't like what you're saying, so you're wrong. What the hell that? What, what the hell is that kind of argument? You, you, you see what I'm trying to do, okay? Think. Think. That's all I care about, okay? Okay. And like I said, now this is the first broadcast today and tomorrow. I'm going to be doing another broadcast like this. I mean, well, today I did it, but tomorrow I'll do another one. And on Wednesday, after the show, you know, now that I've ironed out the kinks, I'm going to be doing a Q&A with my um, webinar tier Patreon supporters. But that'll be starting on Wednesday, okay? And it'll be, um, you know, half an hour to 45 minutes, and it'll be on a Telegram channel. So if you don't know how to use Telegram, I suggest you download the app onto your phone or onto your uh, desktop or laptop. And if you don't know how to figure it out, you know, there are lots of videos on YouTube. It's a very simple system. You should have no trouble using it. And I'll give you the channel that you, wish you would have to join on, on Patreon. That'll be a dedicated post on Patreon just for webinar tier supporters. And you'll join that room and we'll have our Q&A. Okay? Okay. So um, that's all I have to say for today. Take it easy.